Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Esti Beck from the University of Texas Arlington. Esti is uh, a colleague and a researcher who examines social media networks, and uh, she's here to talk a little bit today with us about psychometrics and, and the future of what that looks like for the spaces that we use to, to engage in social activity online. Thank you. I, I first want to thank the planning committee uh, and also uh, Jeff Holmes and ISTEC for the invitation really to speak here today. I am absolutely delighted to talk about this uh, content today because this is in the news with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook surveillance. But in order for me to provide a future vision at the end of the talk, uh, about where we might be for five, five years from now. Uh, I need to take some time looking at historical and then current events to explain the future vision part. So I hope you'll indulge me. All right, so in 2008, Cambridge University accepted Michael Kaczynski for doctoral study at the Psychometric Center. And this is the largest psychometric center in the world. And psychometrics, you can think of this as the, the testing for like IQ test and also the kinds of tests that employers do when they want to uh, examine your behaviors and your beliefs about things. And Kaczynski, as soon as he entered Cambridge University, he teamed with a fellow doctoral student and they launched a Facebook application in 2009 called My Personality. And this app allowed people to answer questions along the Big Five personality. Is anybody familiar with this, the Big Five personality? Okay. All right, so the Big Five personality, it sorts people into five spectrums. And you can recall this by the acronym OCEAN. So O for openness, C for conscientiousness, E for extroversion, A for agreeableness, and N for neuroticism. And so when they developed this app on Facebook and they put it out in 2009, they really thought that just a few friends or colleagues would take the app and then, then the app would be no more. However, they did not anticipate how many people would share the app across Facebook nor how much data they would actually collect from people. So at the end of the questionnaire, they had a, a notice that said, they asked the participants if they wanted to share their Facebook data. They said they were Cambridge University researchers to, to provide an air of credibility. And so people began sharing their data and the app was around for a few years and in 2012 they realized that not hundreds and not thousands or hundreds of thousands but millions of people had taken the personality test. And they saw that what they could do is they could correlate the data from the big five personality to the Facebook data and make some pretty eerily accurate predictions about people. So according to two motherboard reporters who broke the story in January of 2017, the correlations included uh, men who liked on Facebook MAC Cosmetics were probably more likely to be gay, or those who liked the Wu-Tang Clan on Facebook were probably heterosexual, uh, and those who followed Lady Gaga on Facebook were uh, probably more likely to be extroverts. Uh, but they also were able to drill down and see persons, the people's like their political beliefs, uh, their intelligence, and they could even predict drug use with the information. So around 2014, an assistant professor in the psychology department at Cambridge University approached Kaczynski uh, about this application and really about the methods of the correlation. And um, he was approaching, approaching Kaczynski on behalf of a company. And I think through months long discussion and probably feeling like he wasn't going to get uh, like adequate remuneration for his, his work, Kaczynski ultimately backed out of the deal. But he must have disclosed enough information to this assistant professor about how the methods work and how the app worked because Assistant Professor Alexander Kogan, who has been in the news over the past few weeks, he in turn created his own personality app, This Is Your Digital Life, 
And he collected data, and then he took that data set and he sold it to Cambridge Analytica. Now around the time that Kaczynski and Stillwell launched the My Personality app in 2009, Facebook began to realize its potential for generating millions, and then in a few short years, billions of revenue. And for the first time, they introduced language and geographical ad targeting for advertisers to be able to go ahead and implement and create and maintain their own ads. So companies like Apple and PepsiCo and Walmart, they were able to begin advertising pretty widely on the platform. But so did smaller businesses and scam artists who would create advertisements such as, are you an Eddie Izzard fan? We need 100 movie music lovers to test and keep the new iPad. And through what became known as Facebook business, advertisers would target their ads through the demographics the people populated in Facebook and or the, what they liked, the content. Um, and especially they would target along demographic lines uh, such as somebody's marital status if they recently changed it or their geographic location. So for example, if a person announces a recent engagement, they'll all of a sudden start seeing advertisements perhaps for a vacation hotspot or ads might pop up depending on age and sex for hair growth treatments for women to use castor oil or makeup tips for boomer women. So for the Facebook team, vetting credible and authentic advertisements before they're pushed out on the platform, I think didn't and still to a degree doesn't really matter all that much because of revenue, because they break in billions of dollars of revenue every year, but also the premise that Facebook users would, crowd, through crowdsourcing labor, report any ads that did not belong to the network under the terms and conditions of the site. So by the time Cambridge Analytica came along for the 2016 presidential election, the firm understood that they could push out messages at an unprecedented rate on Facebook with no internal oversight or approval by the social media company. And in effect, Cambridge Analytica did get away with sent this, uh, spend, sending any targeted messages they wanted to to millions of people. And I think last reported I saw on Tuesday, it was upwards of 87 million people affected by this. So right now, Cambridge Analytica, this is a screenshot of Alexander Dix, the current suspended CEO, uh, it trends in news reports and with revelations each day about their methods and their nefarious beliefs about winning at all costs by disregarding U.S. election laws, and which prohibit foreign actors from influencing the election, the foreign firm manipulated the information diets of millions of Facebook users to sway an election. Now, media manipulation, this is not a new concept. This has been, a long, this has been around for long before the internet uh, came along, uh, but it is definitely a method for disinformation campaigns, and it is spreading in the information ecosystem at an accelerated and an alarming rate. And a challenge over the next five years will be addressing disinformation campaigns and the fake news plaguing the internet. Because of the surveillance state with so many websites and apps collecting data and analytics, if it's not Cambridge Analytica in the near future, it will be another firm. It'll be another organization. It'll be another nation state actor i.e. Russia, um, that will perform this kind of mini media manipulation. And I suspect it will only increase in five years if active measures are not put in place to stem the tide. So, you know, I was thinking, I was looking at the, the talks earlier today, the, later today about virtual reality and augmented reality, and it would not surprise me if in five years time or 10 years time when augmented reality becomes very mainstream, if somehow then advertisers and then those who wanted to manipulate messages in some way would infiltrate AR and then thinking uh, earlier about what Lee said about technology receding into the background, then people perhaps not really critiquing what is happening in those kinds of environments. Now the public still does not know necessarily all of the specifics or all of the details about Cambridge Analytica. But we do know a few things. 
And there was a, a, this is a really great video, if nobody has ever seen this one by BBC Stories put out last year. And it was um, the interviewer interviewed Teresa Hong, and she was the director of Trump's digital campaign. And the interviewer asked her about the secret sauce of how Cambridge Analytica pulled off what they did. And he asked specifically if they use psychometrics for targeting. And she declined to really answer the question. She said that was their secret. Uh, but the group did, she did disclose that they targeted groups in states based on certain attributes. And so what is known about the targeting excuse me, is the scale. And this quote comes from Easy Lepowski's Wired article and her reporting uh, that really talks about how many ads were running during the election, all of the variants. So I'll just read this off very quick. Quote, Cambridge Analytica took full advantage of the ability to perform massive tests on its ads. On any given day, the campaign was running 40 to 50,000 variants of its ads testing how they performed in different formats, with subtitles without and static versus video, among other small differences. On the day of the third presidential debate in October, the team ran 175,000 variations." End quote. That's staggering. It very much is, yes. Now, the success of the ad variants connects to a well-known manipulation tactic used by problem actors online, amplification of misinformation. And so the viral nature and amplification of provocative posts by both humans and bots disrupts honest and faithful accounts and then also accurate reporting of events. And so we have this example here from Eric Tucker uh, who shared some images of buses in Austin to say this is anti-Trump protesters being bussed in. And he had a relatively small Twitter following when he tweeted this. This particular tweet got over 16,000 shares on Twitter and over 350,000 shares on Facebook. And even after he was called out for reporting inaccurate and misleading information, he did not want to delete the tweet because he enjoyed the popularity that he was getting from the viral nature of this tweet. Now for those conservative outlets like Robertson Family Values and Free Republic and Joe the Plumber that shared this fake news story, the goal of it was to reinforce what's called motivated reasoning. And motivated reasoning is when people are presented with narratives that confirm their very strong emotional beliefs. And so they continue to look for information that reinforces that. And any counter narratives that overwhelmingly present evidence to the contrary of those beliefs, people will tend to ignore those or downplay those because the narrative does not initiate a level of arousal to satisfy and enhance the underlying emotions. So Cambridge Analytica, they did ultimately take advantage of a system of mass surveillance, or Facebook, to play on users' motivated reasoning with a range of personalized ads called from data points from the platform. And the surveillance uh, apparatus, along with mediocre to non-existent Facebook security policies, allowed Alexander Kogan to create a personality app that initially had, I think, approximately 280,000 participants or 250,000 participants. And because of backdoor access through Facebook Graph API, he was able to get his hands on millions of accounts on Facebook. And then he took that data set and then in turn sold that to Cambridge Analytica, where they then in turn launched their 40 to 50,000 ad variants a day to play on people's motivated reasoning to either suppress the vote or to swing independent voters to vote for the conservative candidate. But I think there's an even larger problem besides Cambridge Analytica, and that problem is how companies like Facebook consider consumer privacy. So I'm the, the privacy advocate talking about, some the humanities person about how privacy needs to be really reinforced online. So this past Tuesday and Wednesday, Mark Zuckerberg testified before Congress about Facebook and its role in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. 
And during the conservative Republican uh, Senator Orwin Hatch's um, allocated time to ask questions, he presented a narration. Um, and he gestured that he thought that the larger problem with the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal was a lack of transparency. A lack of transparency in the terms and conditions statements to inform consumers about all of the data that was available to third parties. So I think most of us in this room know that we do not have the luxury of time nor the inclination to read through all of the terms and conditions statements and all of the privacy policies for every website and app that we do, uh, that we, we take on. But to take Hatch's point though, transparency is really only one aspect of a larger debate about surveillance and about privacy and about data collection. And I think if we want to talk about privacy and why it matters, then we need to return to fair information practices. Now these right here, these five fair, fair information practices came first from a FTC recommendation report for privacy online in 1997, when the FTC, after a series of two years of public workshops and talking with industry experts that were primarily actually in insurance and banking at the time, uh, from those industry experts, they advocated they did not want regulation. They wanted time to adopt these kinds of uh, recommendations. And so the FTC suggested or highly recommended to industry to adopt these five principles. Notice and awareness, so those are the terms and conditions statements. Choice and consent, so we check the box, but then we also choose whether or not we're going to participate in you know, the, the policies of the website and app. Access, so consumers should actually be given access to the data that a website and app collects about them. Integrity and security, so security really making sure that the data uh, is not abused or um, uh, broken into or released to the public. And then the final one is enforcement and redress. And I think today that most websites have really adopted three to four of these key principles, except for the last one. And Facebook is the perfect example of this. Uh, this last one, enforcement and redre uh, redress, has really allowed companies like Facebook and Google to write the rules that govern online behavior today. And without true enforcement or redress, how can companies be held liable for data abuse or for lax policies and oversight or for data breaches? And so Congress has been slow to uh, respond to passing legislation that would offer um, regulations for consumer privacy or to strengthen that for consumers here in the United States. So what do we do? I'm going to talk a minute about why data matters before, data privacy matters before I answer that question. So whenever we go online, whether it's through our mobile phones, our tablets, or our desktop computers, we risk our privacy. We are vulnerable. We risk losing control over both our visible and our invisible digital identities. So our visible identities, those are the ones that we control by what we enter in drop-down boxes, click in radio buttons, put in fields about our demographics. But the invisible digital identities, we do not control those. Those are generated by Google, by Facebook, by Amazon, by Netflix. And they surveil us, and they track our movements online, and they use that information to place us within categories for easy management, uh, to deliver advertising or other content-based services. But there is benefit to this, of course. I mean, personalization does provide us with an ease of access and also with benefits. But why data, data privacy matters? So, if we mask our IP addresses and we implement do not track technologies on our devices and we use VPNs to connect, we can somewhat reduce our privacy, our risk for privacy invasion. Uh, but data privacy also matters because it limits the power that companies have over our personal data and our invisible digital identities. And the reason that Cambridge Analytica was so effective in their digital political campaign is the use of Facebook's existing advertising platform and because they left open their API so that third parties could have a treasure trove of data. 
So even though people consent to data collection during the sign-up process and continue to agree to the terms of conditions while they're using the websites and apps, um, we don't necessarily know how companies really use our data. Sure, that's outlined, and we understand that in an abstract sense, um, but we don't know really who they share the data to or how they share the data or how much profit they're making from the data. That's just an unknown for us. And because Cambridge Analytica is a success, data privacy matters even more because we need to limit persuasive and targeted propaganda campaigns online. And we've already seen evidence of this from a study conducted by a Facebook researcher with a faculty member and a graduate student where they pulled approximately 700,000 Facebook users who, it was actually without their consent, was not written in terms and conditions at that time that uh, Facebook uh, researchers could actually um, perform this kind of uh, empirical research. But they wanted to know if emotional contagion was a possibility. So they manipulated the news feeds. So for people who saw more negative posts, uh, they found that people actually responded more negatively with their posts. And then for people who saw more positive posts, they tended to respond more positively. So through their research, even though it was unethical at the time, I mean, there is actually empirical evidence to show um, just how susceptible we are to manipulation and persuasive messaging online. So we do have do not track technologies now, but there still is yet to be an industry-wide standard of practices for when a website receives a signal. Uh, dedicated researchers, academics, and attorneys with W3C, and then also the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, they are working on this with policy statements and with code, uh, but we do need standard practices for do not track signals. But we also need regulation desperately here in the United States to keep companies accountable for internal policies that allow the company to, or third parties to abuse data. So I leave this talk now with not a future vision, but instead I am going to issue a call for all of the students that are here today. So when faculty and business leaders and politicians say to the next generation um, that we look to you for the solutions, we, we really do mean it, uh, but we are also looking for you to contribute novel and innovative ideas. And for those of you that are here today from computer science and from engineering and from business, how will you use your intellectual energy over the next five years to find solutions to the erosion of consumer privacy online? For those of you that are here from the humanities, how will you make sure companies who do business online are accountable for any wrongdoings that they do? Thank you. <laughs>